Hi, everybody. And first of all, thank you for being part of this uh, Enneagram class, um, which is totally Robert's creation. It's been a privilege to uh, be his co-pilot, but really he designed this and organized it. And I've just kind of come along for the ride. And I have learned so much from him. And I am deeply, deeply appreciative of his wisdom and his abundant love that flows through uh, every one of his teachings. He is, I assure you, as loving as the material that he teaches. So my contribution to his last and beautiful class, um, as usual, I had notes and then I start juggling them once he starts teaching. Um, and he inspired when he was, when, when Robert was talking about detachment. I have um, often heard people say, someone should do something. Someone should do something about this. Or um, I don't watch the news. It's just too negative. It's just too negative. And this kind of choice to remove yourself from the collective because you don't like the news or you don't like what's going on or, or whatever. And that is a choice to actually, um, how do I say this? It's an insult to your power. That's one way to put it. It's a very direct way to put it, but it's you underestimate, you underappreciate, that's the word, um, what you're made of and what you're doing here. Nobody was born to ignore life. Nobody was born to say someone else should do something. When you are positioned someplace to be a witness, and you are witnessing an injustice or you are witnessing something that is wrong. Looking at someone else and saying, someone should do something. Or turning to the internet to write a negative comment and thinking that that's going to take care of it. Is a form of not tapping into your resources. But most of all, you're not tapping into love. And I don't, I do not mean personal love. You are not tapping into the power of the life love force to, to make a difference. You are not using yourself as a loving vessel of transformation that is called upon in that moment to contribute some part of your life force, your love force, to what you are witnessing. Even if in that moment you simply go into the impersonal domain, the cosmic domain of prayer, and you just say, let, let your love flow through me to this and contribute something toward its healing, toward its transformation. If it's not your love, then say to the universe, let, let your love flow through me. If it's something that you cannot personally love, that you cannot personally tolerate, but you know it needs to be repaired, then say a great big, huge prayer. Let your love flow me because through me because I'm not capable of loving this. I am not. I am struggling with it. So a love greater than myself has to flow through me. And, and please, I, I can be a vessel for that while I work on myself while I work on myself. And, and in that, I'll feel the conflict because I know I need to respond more generously. I know I need to respond more 
lovingly. This is this the name of this class is holy love. That's big love. That is that is holy life force. That to me, I, I oftentimes want to take the word love out because it's always personalized. And when it gets personal, it gets blurry in terms of its power, in terms of its its the fact that it is all there is, that it is the life force, and it is the force of God. And um, however it is, you understand the divine. Um, for me, for me, God is light, God is law, and God is this creative force behind which all life, all, all everything is created. There is no off-planet God. But in the journey of the soul, I have come to realize that the, the more we make choices that respond to the suffering of humanity, that respond to the whole, the more the whole responds to us, the more we we, we recognize that we are part of the whole and that what we do in some way contributes to the whole. And we know that, I know that, because I can feel, I always sit on my leg when I teach, it just, it, it angles me. <laughs> It steadies me because I just get so wound up. But as as you expand your your um, focus beyond yourself to include to include the pursuit of how life works, the pursuit of how why why humanity does what it does. Why, why are we at war? What, why is peace such a challenge? What, why, why, is, why is generosity such a challenge? Why is it so hard to empower other people? Why are people so afraid of other people? Look at this war, and I think, I read this quote, war is fought by young men who don't know each other, who are sent to kill each other, but it's begun by old men who resent each other, who do know each other. And isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? <clears throat> These absurdities that, that fill this collective atmosphere, would they not be resolved much easier if we were not afraid? of the power of love. Not personal, but by looking at each other as human beings that have families, that have children, that love just the way we do, that cherish our children just the way we do, that just want to live and have their, their holy days and their holidays and their days in the park and and welcome springtime and plant their gardens this is what life is this is there's always the bad apples that start getting greedy and want more and they they do what they do on the side but if the majority of people shared a collective human values love values life force values they wouldn't get away with that so easily. One of the um, subjects Robert listed under holy love was calling all angels. And I thought, what a delicious thing to share with you, which is guidance. Because this on the last class is a perfect place to share how is there a payoff? Is there a payoff for deciding I I I will turn to love? I will use I will use myself as a vessel. I'll do love experiments instead of choosing angry language. I'll hold back and think 
is there is there a kinder word I can use when I speak to this person? Is there a kinder tone of voice I can use? Is there a kinder way of thinking? And as a medical intuitive, all my years, all my years in, in, in health, what amazed me, several things, several things amazed me, but it really did as I grew to appreciate how much impact we actually had in, in what happens within our physical, mental, psychological, spiritual form, that there was a co-creative dynamic going on. And if it was going on in our micro earth, it by God was going on in our macro earth, that we, that, that this is not a dead thing that just responds to a cheeseburger that I ate that it also responds to the way I thought. And if you pay attention to yourself, really pay attention, go into the observational mode and pay attention. You cannot help but notice that if you dwell in anger or resentment or self-pity or any of those negative thoughts, that your body will give you the gift of negativity. You will feel negative, anger, anger starts your blood boiling, literally. And eventually you'll start getting headaches and, and, and your joints will start swelling from it. You'll get, a, you'll, get a, you'll get conditions that ache. You'll get chronic pain. You'll get, you'll get conditions, stomach. You'll get stomach issues. You'll, this, the anger is and resentment, rage, these do not settle well within your bio-spiritual ecology. It just doesn't. But if you dwelled on love, even if you counteracted these ordinary human emotions, let's face it, everybody gets angry, everybody gets resentful, everybody gets that kind of way, everybody gets exhausted. But if you decided, in addition to taking an aspirin, you decided, I need to put my feet up and just think about love for a minute. I need to, 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 to think about something I love. I need to think, get to appreciation. I need to get to a place where I'm flowing again. I need to get to that place. I need to because my life is not all that bad and I, am, I will not be captured, as Teresa of Avila would say. I will not let a reptile control me. And that's what she called these dark thoughts, reptiles. You have to get back to, to a place of love because as a prayer, dwelling in love, searching for it, seeking it, trying to make that your, your, your everyday main diet, main diet, even though you may have a side dish of resentment, your main diet is appreciation and love. It's like saying a prayer every day in an indirect way. Thank you for my life. Thank you for my life. Thank you. Thank you for putting me here. It wasn't a mistake and I'm not lost and, and you didn't screw up. But dwelling in anger, Dwelling in resentment, thinking nothing works, da 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 da, complaining, complaining, and self pity is like saying to God, You screwed up. You screwed up and you owe me an explanation, and I am not living my life. I'm not playing. I won't do a thing until I get an explanation for this. It's like a tantrum, which brings me to guidance. How does guidance work? How does guidance work? It's actually um, spiritually logical. Just think of yourself as a parent. Think of yourself like when your child or when anybody is in a rage, do you then offer guidance? Is that the best time to make a suggestion to someone, especially if that suggestion is not going to strike them the right way? especially if then. Is that the best time? Don't you usually decide there's got to be a right, better time for me 
to introduce to this person a higher idea that they have to change, that he or she has to shift a habit, maybe drop sugar, maybe consider that they're an alcoholic, maybe they have to apologize, maybe they have to really deal with the impact of their pride and prideful decisions on the people around them. But this is not the right time to do that. I'm just going to back off because they're in a really bad place. Guidance works like that. Guidance works just like that. Now, if someone came up to you and said, I really am looking for counsel on how to, I love this person and I need counsel on how to provide loving guidance for them. The door is wide open. The door is wide open. The possibility of how that discussion can happen, of what can be said, of how it can be said, is wide open, is infinite. Counsel is grace, not guidance. It's grace. It's one of the graces. How do angels work? How do they work? They to say work, that's not even the right word. What's angelic protocol? Let's put it that way. Love greases angelic wheels, shall we say. Intention, um, the functioning of your heart, the functioning of, of you, and where, why you're asking for guidance. And, and how, what, the temperature within you. The, um, I'm no expert on angels, but I've had experiences of my own, in my own way. And um, while I've never seen an angel that I know of, I've, I've had those incredible experiences of hearing guidance and very clearly, very directly, very briefly, very clearly, very directly, very briefly. And each time, each time guidance has been delivered in that whispering, unmistakable voice, it has always been to direct me to the next place next decision, next choice I need to make. And I have made that choice within one hour. I have never so far, so far, so far dropped that ball. And in each case, it has improved, redirected the whole of my life or saved my life or saved my life. In none of the cases was I focused on um, trying to understand another person or, or anger or any negative emotion whatsoever. In fact, I would have to say that in when I asked for guidance, what do, what do I do next? In one case, when I moved from New Hampshire back to the Midwest, I, I, I was living in a state of confusion or chaos, but I wasn't actively praying in the sense of, what do I do? What do I do? But I was living in this way that said, that was like an active prayer. Um, an act of trust that was, I'll be here until I'm not supposed to be here, I guess. I mean, I, it never occurred to me that I wouldn't be guided. And that is itself a form of living in the love and life force of God. Just, it, it never occurred to me that I would not get guidance when I needed guidance. I, I, I can't explain it any other way. And when I was on my way back from England, I was teaching over in England, and it was 1992, 
the plane's landing in Boston, and I look out, and of course, Boston is a magnificent city. And the stewardess said, you know, um, Americans welcome home, and everyone else welcome to the United States. And I looked out the window, and I thought, this isn't my home. And all of a sudden, I felt detached, like this incredible detachment, as if all my connections, now this is the kind of detachment that Robert was not talking about. This was not my choice to detach because I didn't care. It was quite the opposite. It was when you want to care and you can't be attached, which is a very different kind of feeling. Anyway, I, I get back to my the farm on, in New Hampshire. I have my luggage. I walk right in the door and boom, I hear the guidance, move home now. Just like that. Just like that. That's all. And I, I put down my luggage. I never took off my coat. I arranged the whole move in 20 minutes, everything, everything. Contacted the people and said, I'm moving out of the farmhouse. I got I got a van from U-Haul, got my brother a plane ticket so he could help drive me home. I mean, got the whole thing, got my movers to come in, The P, got a team to help pack up the house, and then I took off my coat. 20 minutes. Guidance works with this sense of, I'm asking for my better good, and I'll do what you tell me, and and I I won't I won't fight it. It guidance always directs you. The way the angels work is, they will never eclipse or interfere with your life. They won't make a decision for you. But when you are always in that sort of, what do I do? Where do I, where do I go? What, what do you need me to do, to do, to do next? And, and you are not living in resentment. I was not living in resentment. Maybe that's the part I need to, I, I was always living in this sense of awe. Like, this is so cool. I have the coolest life. I live on a farm. I was poor as a church mouse. I live on a farm. And it's just so beautiful. And I don't even have to lock my doors. And I had a cat named Mousetrap. And I could, I went over to, to, to Europe. I taught there. I came back. I just, I had wonderful friends. Everything was awesome to me. I was always filled with awe. So what was there to complain about? I was always filled with awe. And I offer this to you as a way of positioning your life to think, am, do I dwell ever in awe? Do I ever sit back and think, what's really incredible about my life? Because that too is like turning on a spigot of cosmic love for your own for the flow of your own life, for cosmic love, for turning on the spigot. It says, I really want to appreciate the, the, the gift of this life and how can I share the gift of my life with other people? Uh, if I have not said that prayer yet, God, I'm sorry, but I'm saying it now. How can I share the gift of my life with other people? And that may be the beginning of how you experience the power of holy love, that you never again say, somebody should do something. You're the person, if you see it, even in your heart, if you say, just let some grace flow through me to this. You're the only one that knows, needs to know you said that prayer. But even standing there, I promise you, Light will blast through you to another person.